consider the functions f and g. And the property of these functions is that f is greater than g and that both of them are positive. Now, in the first video on improper integrals, we studied things like the integral from 2 up to infinity of functions like this. So, for example, we might be interested in the area under the curve from the value of 2 all the way to infinity. And what we saw is that these kind of improper integrals, it may converge to a finite value, that this area converges to a finite number, or it may be that it diverges. Now, what I want to do in this video is a comparison test, a way to talk about improper integrals involving f and compare them to integrals involving g and try to get some sort of convergence or divergence information out of it. So, for example, suppose it was the case that this integral, this integral from 2 to infinity of f of x, did converge, it converged to a finite value l. Well, what then can we say about the same kind of integral, but now for the g, I want to ask, what is the integral from 2 up to infinity of g of x dx? Does it converge? Does it diverge? What can we say? Maybe we can't say anything. Well, if I look at this picture and I try to intuitively think about what's happening, we know that this area is positive for both of them. Indeed, the f is bigger than the g, and g is bigger than 0. But the g here is sort of sandwiched between it has to be positive, but it has to be some number that's smaller than the integral of the f, and we know that that converges by our assumption. So it seems reasonable to conclude that the integral from 2 to infinity of g of x converges as well. I don't know what it converges to, it might be a very different value where there's no guarantee it's the same L, but I think it does converge. And the fact that G is positive here is important, it means it, it can't have a scenario where it goes above and beneath the axis over and over and over again and has sort of an oscillatory behavior and diverges for that reason. Uh, because it's positive, but beneath the F, I think indeed it's going to converge. Now, let's state this a little bit more precisely. I'll take the f and the g, and I'll focus on those. And I have this order, f is greater than g, which is greater than 0. Now, if I take any definite integral, we know the result. We had this theorem back in calculus 1. So a definite integral where a and b are numbers, it says that the definite integral of f of x is greater than the definite integral of the same domain of g of x, and it's definitely going to be positive. So now I can use this to talk about convergence. If I imagine what happens for the improper integral, where the b here is replaced with infinity, the way improper integrals are defined is that it's a limiting concept. You take a limit as the b values go off towards infinity. But in that case, because it's always going to be greater than it, it says that if the bigger one converges, if the f converges, then so too does the smaller one, so too does the g. And so we have this comparison test. Conversely, we can go the other way around. So if the smaller one diverges to infinity, then the bigger one must diverge as well. That is to say, if the g of x is going to diverge, then the f of x, the integral from a up to infinity of the f of x, that must diverge as well. Now, notice carefully that this result is about convergence versus divergence, but it doesn't tell me what it converges to. If the big one converges to L, it doesn't tell you what the small one converges to. Something smaller than L and bigger than zero for sure, but the exact value we don't know. Now, if we're going to apply the comparison test, we have to have something to compare functions to. And there is one class of integrals that are well known that we have an answer and that we sort of saw a little bit in the previous video. This is the class of integrals 1 over x to the p as you take the integral from, say, 1 up to infinity. What we saw previously is that if I had something like 2 for the value of p, so 1 over x squared, that that did converge, but that if I had p equal to 1, then the antiderivative of this was logarithm and that was going to diverge. Indeed, generally we're going to have the result that this so-called p integral, it converges for all p values that are strictly greater than 1, and it diverges for all p values that are between 0 and 1. We saw some special cases of this in the previous video, but I'd actually encourage you to go and work this out and verify that that claim is true. But now that I have this, now that I have this sort of p integral, it allows me to do a lot of simplification on other integrals that are related but a bit more complicated. For example, consider this one. This is the integral from 1 up to infinity of x minus 2 divided by x cubed plus 1. Now, what I want to do is 
take this integrand, which is messy, and I'm actually just going to focus just on the integrand for a moment, and I am going to do a comparison by writing inequalities to a p-interval. Look at the numerator first, x minus 2. x minus 2, because I am subtracting 2, is a smaller number than just x. So why don't I take this x minus 2 and I will relate it to x, and I get to put an inequality. This is smaller than x over x cubed plus 1. Okay, well now let me look at the plus 1. Well, the plus 1 now is on the bottom, so adding 1 makes the denominator bigger, which makes the whole thing smaller. So if I don't add this 1, I'm going to get something that's actually going to be bigger. So I can replace this with x divided by x cubed. I have a string of inequalities. And then, of course, x over x cubed is just 1 over x squared. So this is a p integrand with the value p equal to 2. This is exactly what we saw in the previous video, and we know that this integral is going to converge. So what we can finally conclude is that because the integral from 1 up to infinity of 1 over x squared converges, that we know, that's a p integral, that deduces that the integral from 1 up to infinity of this new complicated thing, this x minus 2 over x cubed plus 1, that thing must also converge. So there's a little bit of a trade-off at play here. We gain something and we lose something. The thing that we gain is that we're allowed to make a lot of simplifications. This x minus 2 over x cubed plus 1, that's a hard integral. Uh, I tried for a little bit, I didn't get an obvious answer, maybe you could go and try. The truth of the matter is that huge classes of integrals actually do not have some method that you're able to integrate it, at least not in terms of elementary functions like polynomials and sines and cosines. There's all sorts of ones that you just cannot do. So often we can never find the exact value, at least not by analytically finding an antiderivative. So the advantage here is that we're able to simplify this complicated thing we don't know into something that's easier that we do know. And the disadvantage of this approach is that you lose the information of exactly what finite value it converges to, and we're only able to conclude, yes, it converges, but we don't know what it converges to. Final thing I want to talk about is that this theorem only works one direction. The other direction, it doesn't apply. So, for example, if you have the bigger function and the smaller function, you know that the smaller function converges. It doesn't tell you anything about the bigger function, whether that converges or diverges. Indeed, diverging is bigger than whatever finite value the smaller one converges. Uh, likewise, if the bigger one diverges, the smaller one may diverge or it may converge, you don't know. So the comparison test only tells us when the big one converges, the small one converges, and when the small one diverges, the big one diverges as well.